Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. We've done about 660 of them now. If this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com and look under the past interviews menu where you'll see the oh, previous ones organized in several different ways it's actually easier to navigate than the youtube channel in terms of organization um, if you'd like to be no notified of future ones and especially the live stream but also when we post new ones subscribe to the channel and click that little bell that pops out when you hit the subscribe button and also there's an upcoming interviews page on that gap um which has the, these little icons in the right hand column if you click one of those you can add a notification to your calendar program whatever it is um about the future live interviews so you can watch them live if you want to okay my guest today is dr Annalose smitsman she is a futurist evolutionary systems scientist coach healer and award-winning best-selling author she is the founder and CEO of Earthwise Center, which she'll explain. Her programs, practices, and strategies are sought after around the world for actualizing our future human potential and catalyzing the next steps in human consciousness and systemic design uh, for thrivability. She was awarded the Visioneers Lifetime Achievement Award in May 2022 and was crowned overall African winner in the category Human Development of the 2022 Africa's Most Respected CEOs Awards. She is the co-author of the award-winning Future Humans Trilogy with Dr. Jean Houston and a member of the Evolutionary Leaders Circle. Um, here's a quote that I pulled off her website. I thought I'd read it. In each of us already exist the future potentials of the emerging new era, the next step of human consciousness and the evolution of our species. I am here to help you access and actualize this potential in yourself, your relationships, and the systems and cultures you form part of to co-create and become the worlds and futures where we can thrive and blossom together. So welcome, Ana Luz. Good to Thank have you Thank you here. so much. Great right. to be with you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, Ana Luz is in Mauritius, which is a small island in the out, way out in the ocean um, east of Madagascar. And I guess it is, is it in some way considered part of Africa because that's why you got this African Achievement Award? Correct. It's part of the African region in, and Indian Ocean region. Yes. <laughs> right. Okay. I was looking at pictures of it on the internet yesterday, and it really seems like a kind of a Shangri-La, <laughs> a delightful place to live. <clears throat> um, I've always been interested in the future and futurism and, and stuff like that. I've I've read books about prophecies that ancient cultures, you know, wrote down, and many of which have come true. And uh, I've I felt since the seventies that the world is going to undergo some very big changes and that we're probably getting close to that. And I think a lot of people have felt like that. I mean, remember all the fuss that came around, what was it 2012 when, when there was supposed to be this huge change. And so I think a lot of people with a spiritual orientation and even people in other fields feel that the pace of change is extremely fast now and, you know, accelerating. And uh, we don't know what the world's going to be like in 10, 20, 30 years. And many people feel it's going to be, kind of a hellscape with environmental catastrophe and political uh, strife and all kinds of things but others feel like okay it's going to get rough and it's already rough but we're going to get through this and it's going to be really nice on the other side so, so that's a that's a brief summation of my sense of you know where things are and where they're going um I, I, how does that jibe with with your vision mm, well yes i mean it describes i call, like to call about it in terms of two futures so that there's um, a future past which is the result uh, in in many ways of you know some really catastrophic actions that we've taken as a humanity um that is destroying the conditions uh, for planetary well-being and health and so this is kind of the future past that's now manifesting as a and we we call that the sustainability crisis and then the other hand, there is also um, the potential for an emerging new future, an emerging new era. 
And you could say that that future really is one that I think that many of the seers and, and prophets and wisdom keepers yeah, uh, of all kinds of cultures um, of our human family have been talking about for a very long time, that there is the opportunity in the midst of so many changes and catalytic changes um, that also in, in the collapse and tipping point conditions, because there is a, this you know, structuring, decoupling of earlier belief systems, earlier worldviews, it provides an opening, it provides a portal to truly, as a collective, give birth um, to you know, a higher possibility of what it means to be human on this planet. So that's also always the one that gives me hope that despite all the challenges that we are faced with and that we need to be very, very aware of, but that you can still get up <laughs> in the day and say, you know what, this is giving me even more reason to help co-create a world that works, to help co-create a world in which all of us can thrive together. Um, and that is truly manifesting uh, also a higher possibility of who we as a humanity can be. Mm. In your book, The Quest of Rose, which is the first book yes. in the trilogy, um, the main character, Rose, uh, you know, got COVID and she nearly died, and but then she survived and she came out of it. And uh, I, it sort of tells a story in the book about how that near death for her was a, uh, a, a shifting point after which all kinds of possibilities opened up for her. And I think it was supposed to symbolize what might be happening to society on a larger scale. And in fact, I, you can elaborate on this, but I, as I recall in the book, um, you and Jean Houston, who wrote it with you, um, cited examples, um, or maybe this was in an interview I heard you give, of how there were really difficult times in the past in, in various cultures, like plagues and things like that. And then after that, there was this huge blossoming uh, of culture and science and arts and all that. Um, do you feel like you know, this pandemic we've been through is something along those lines and that we might be already coming into a, a blossoming period? I'm not sure we're yet in a blossoming. I think we are really the pre-Renaissance. So it's, it's like a new emerging re Renaissance, but mm -hmm. we are just prior to those Renaissance uh, conditions. And that's indeed, we talked about this in the book and also in the interviews that we could see in the previous Renaissance as well. Um, just prior to that, we could, mm. you know, there were a lot of disease, uh, a lot of crisis uh, experiences. But then, again, because probably because of those catalytic conditions, um, that it also started to catalyze an enormous amount of creativity, um, you know, a way to to re envision what it means to be <laughs> part of this human family. That the previous Renaissance, of course, was more oriented around Europe and it had a, a huge shadow, and that's colonialism uh, that often we forget about. <laughs> so it may have been really very positive and transformative for people within Europe, but not so uh, elsewhere in the world. And, and this is why we like to call about this. And that's not just us, but you know, many movements are talking about a new regenerative renaissance and regenerative in the sense that it's it's giving birth again to um you know the sense of our humanity that is not about yet one culture or um you know society dominating over others but it truly coming into this co-creation collaboration that's also part of the maturation of our species so indeed coming back to you know rose as the the main character indeed of our book um she is uh, in the story she's a woman in her mid-20s and she is hospitalized with severe COVID uh, symptoms and this is really at, at the beginning of the crisis when i myself was actually uh stuck in the netherlands and able to return home uh, to my children i was stuck in in for seven months um, mm. because all the flights were cancelled so that also as a kind of background and backdrop <laughs> and gene and i were you know every day on the phone and to really say, living our own personal version of this crisis um and myself also going through the COVID, uh, COVID conditions myself and so rose in that story i went see gets this inkling of, oh, oh, I am dying. My old reality, my old world is dying. And she's had premonitions and dreams um, of always coming at this crossroads 
a feeling that the road on which she was was coming to a sudden stop and i think that's again symbolic what we're feeling now a lot of people are feeling that their, their lives don't make sense their work the way they've been you know going to work for other people um they feel like what's the point of that so it's this this experience that many people are having that the the old roads are not taking us to the future that is calling us so in the story then when rose realizes that uh, her old life is dying she says to the cosmos to the universe look i'm so young <laughs> really this can't be it help me find the ways to renew myself and to heal myself and then she slips beyond the veils her heart stops um, for a few minutes and she goes through near-death experience and as that happens she then discovers really the power of conscious choice and what she discovers in that moment is that every choice that we make is a coordinate of consciousness so that every choice that you make imagine that we are in this universe of consciousness this incredible body of consciousness so every choice point that we are making is a coordinate in that body and therefore starts to activate different possibilities so she then discovers how her future human choice is really the choice now to start activating like an imaginal cell who she can be from this new cycle of time this new emerging era and what she discovers that the potentials of consciousness in that conscious future human choice of the emerging new era helps us to kind of enter into where we are now from a very, very different perspective. So rather than feeling that we are in the midst of the crisis, everything breaking down, coming to this stop, we start to see that instead, because we're coming in from a higher order of possibility, we start to see how to now work and really get creative with everything that's no longer working in the world, but not from a place of rejection, but rather to get creative and innovative with it and that is really the catalyst then also for this renaissance uh, period mm. just uh, about an hour ago i was um, washing the dishes and listening to a uh, tv show called 60 minutes and there was a segment mm -hmm. on how um teen suicides went way up or attempted suicides and actual suicides during the pandemic and that now that the pandemic is tapering off unfortunately this trend of teen suicides is not tapering off and they were saying how the you know the the mental health care systems are overwhelmed and it takes months to get an appointment and and all this stuff um so you know you hear something like that and you and you feel like well um you know the youth who are really the hope of the future sound like they're pretty depressed and discouraged um do you from your perspective and you know all the people you talk to and all the feedback you must have gotten from your books yes. um do you feel that there's a lot of people out there who aren't making the news who have the opposite of suicidal tendencies in other words they're optimistic and they're thinking creatively and in new ways and and um you know there's a real wave of such people that are rising up yes i'm but as you're saying they're not making the news many of them right. and that that is really unfortunate so i mean i am a mother of two sons 12 and 14 years old yeah and indeed what you know what they're bombarded with is is all of the crisis news and and too little uh, of the creative and innovative capacities and also you know too little reminders that look as a humanity we have faced very very difficult times it's not the first time that we are in the midst of a crisis what i think is new now is that the way that we can also communicate um be conscious about it and of course you know we've never ourselves as a species been destroying the planetary conditions for us to live here i mean that is just an untold and unheard of but what i think that the teenagers and, and you know you've also the the children what we need to share with them is not that oh sorry 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 you know we're burdening you um with this almost unlivable planet uh, so that they're feeling well okay great what are we going to do about this now and it's all falling on our shoulders and you know it's all going to waste so that's the kind of the sentiment that many are having but rather to saying this is an unprecedented time for the very first time ever we can actually be in conversation about this for the very first time ever you know we can learn about what's happening here mauritius you are in the united states 
And we have more power as people than we may realize. Yeah? We have also the power to create new different economic and political systems, to create new constitutions, um, to really let our voices be heard. So I feel that, um, and I've done a lot of work in curriculum development, for example, um, and there I started with that on the narrative of sustainable development. And that doesn't really inspire a lot of youth, but if you're talking about thrive education, you know, regenerative education, transformative education, and actually asking you, what future do you want? What future lives in you? I remember when I was here in Mauritius doing this process of dialogues with youth all over the island and asked them, what future is alive in you? When, when you close your eyes at night, you know, what future calls you forward? What motivates you to, to, to get up in the morning and to develop yourself? Many, many of these young people told me, nobody's ever asked me that. Nobody's ever asked me. They've always only just told me, do this so you succeed, do that so you get a job, and, and all the shoots, all the musts. So it's really important we are engaging the creativity of, um, of young people. And, you know, whenever you engage a person's creativity, you engage life inside that person. When you engage life inside the person, there's future. That to me is what future is. And the death of creativity is, is, is the death of future. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of a competition in a way because in a sense we need routine work and we need systematic repetitive things in order to produce stuff in order to accomplish a lot of things we can't reinvent the wheel every day but on the other hand that routine kind of kills the genius in people you know it, it dampens yes. their creativity so you know somehow we have to find a balance where there can you know if we have to do things somewhat repetitively um we can and yet at the same time, be awakening our, our inner creativity and not have the two clash with one another. Yes, and, and even more so, um, bring your consciousness into the routine. So, for example, um, I have a washing machine, dishwashing machine, but I choose not to use it <laughs> <laughs> on purpose. Yeah, I'm renting a place and it's part of the rental, you know, so, so I use a dishwashing machine. So when I'm doing the dishes, which is terribly repetitive, right? I make a little ritual out of that. Um, for example, as I'm you know, scrubbing the, the plates, I can add the intention that I'm purifying certain aspects of my life. You know, I can say I'm, I'm washing away all the worry, worries and the sorrows and, <laughs> and the heaviness. So it's, it's like I can project my life onto the dishes. And then as I'm doing the act of cleaning the dishes, I'm cleaning an aspect of my life. So you can get creative with that. Or sometimes I can write, just working with the movement of repetition, you know, your body is, is, you know, an automatic pilot doing, say, for example, the dishes or something else. That you can also use it as a meditative moment, actually, to let your mind just zoom out and, and space out. So what's really important is intentionality. So wherever you bring your intentionality, that's, again, you're engaging consciousness, you're activating consciousness inside you. Uh, and that means you are activating life, <laughs> a life potential inside you. And that way, is rather than becoming the repetition and the repetition just going habitual, you're working now consciously with structures um, in, a, in a way that actually helps you to develop yourself, helps you to develop your concentration. And for a long time, I was trained as a pianist. Um, and when you when you want to you know to learn the piano it's incredibly repetitive and you have to do your scaling here <laughs> and as fast as you go but what i notice is if i am not aware of what i'm doing so if i'm going into repetition doing a scale just to 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 you know to make it go past my muscles are actually not learning anything in that moment but if i'm putting my my consciousness my awareness my mind fully into it and I'm doing the same skill and saying I'm doing it five times, but I hold the intention that I'm doing every five times. It's slightly different. Just a slight difference in touch, intonation, and where I put the accents. Yeah? Now my, my whole body mind is engaged and then I'm learning. And then you actually need far less time on the repetitive movement than if we are 
you know, just falling asleep with it and, and not existing in those moments uh, in a conscious way. Huh. That's great. Sounds like mindfulness or a practical application of mindfulness. Um, yes. Yeah. And I've obviously, you know, so many people are not mindful. You see these things on TV of people walking into trees while they're looking at their phone. <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> um, yeah. And there's so much coming at us these days in, in the world. Um, bombarded, you know, with information. Yes. Um, so, and I kind of enjoy it. I mean, I'm a bit of an information junkie myself. I'm, I'm just always sort of, you know, taking things in. But I also meditate a few hours a day. And um, somehow I, I strike a balance <laughs> between <laughs> um, yes. what, Oh, did you want to come in on that? Or I have another question if you don't? No, it's okay. You continue. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was wondering when you went around the, uh, Mauritius and interviewed all these kids about what gets yes. them out of bed in the morning, you know, and they were like surprised that anyone was asking them that. What did you find that, you know, what kind of answers did they give? Some were very sad. Some were, uh, for example, saying, in the future that I want, um, mom and dad are not fighting at night or dad is not coming home drunk. Yeah, uh, I am safe. I mean, th these were children that are, came from very difficult households and actually they, and then I work with them to draw that out, to, to make little drawings and paintings because for some, it was even so difficult to talk about that. So all of them were actually in, in these kids somehow talking about a future in which it was safe to be a child. It was safe to play. There was less violence. Um, nature uh, was green again, uh, the island was clean, the turtles were not dying because they were not swallowing the plastic. Um, and But most of all, you know, people were not arguing and people were not fighting. And mm. so that when I did those dialogues with the kids, that's when I realized, whoa, I have internalized the violence probably much more than we realized it because they were not even talking about the violence of, or oh, I'm not watching a, a TV game or uh, yeah, something with violence. No, they're talking about it's safe for me to be a kid. I can play outside and, and, you know, and be safe. I can, I can be a child. Yeah. 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 Um, as you ponder the future and you've been doing that for a long time now. Yes. Do you have um, some kind of a timeline and, do you have like multiple scenarios that could play out? Like, do you know who Dwayne Elgin is? Mm, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, Lovely I've, man. Yes. Yeah. I've interviewed him a couple of times. And in the most recent one, we talked about his new book, Choosing Earth. And there was a little video mm. that we played in which he outlined um, three different time uh, scenarios that he envisioned. One would be that everything's going to collapse and just become totally chaotic and stay that way for a long time. Another was that everything is going to collapse. And then there'll be some kind of Chinese style, artificial intelligence controlled society all over the world. And then the third one was that everything's going to collapse. All three of them involve collapse. Everything's going to collapse. But then there's this spiritual undercurrent that's going along that's going to, uh, you know, lift everything up again and we'll end up in a much um you know more enlightened world so you know if you were to draw timelines like that would you concur with Dwayne's, or do you have your own vision of the possibilities mm, well there are alignments on some aspects so when it, let's first talk about the, the planetary conditions of course so the timeline is what what you're seeing and this has been a you know a process again long long in the making and uh, that we're seeing manifest so but with regards to the climate and biodiversity crisis um and i'm now sharing this more also from a system science uh perspective there is all there is a delay in the system there's a catching up of the system in in it in, in not in, not in a, in a good way. What we're seeing now is that, especially this year, we really have entered these tipping point times. So we're seeing escalation events. Yeah, uh, for example, the, the more ice that's also melting around all, uh, the poles and elsewhere, you have less reflection uh, capacity of the planet. So you're seeing that you know the, the warming is is getting worse. The uh, climate extremes are, are getting worse. We're having one of the worst droughts and heat waves in Europe, for example, uh, in the United States uh, as well. Um, so we're seeing more of more of those extremes that are, I mean, really, really bringing it home to people now that this is serious. You know, um, 
the climate crisis is is a reality and it's a huge huge wake up call however <laughs> what i'd like to you know um put there emphasize as well we do not yet know how mother earth is going to balance herself it's like she's running a, a huge fever uh, very small changes in temperatures can have major effects in all of her ecosystems and, and of course her lungs, her planetary organs, the oceans is, is in a very, very bad state with you know, at least 80%, some of some marine scientists are saying is, is that. Um, you know, there's now that the risk of the ocean becoming what we call an atimeter, so that all of that methane at, a, at the bottom of the ocean, once that starts to... So, that's not a good news story and so that's what i think Dwayne elgin is also talking about the, the, these collapse scenarios um that's not pessimistic thinking it's about you know we need to get realistic about um ecosystemic changes ha have been set in motions as a result of of human action so fossil fuel based industry then of course also the uh, because it's not an emission story only the biodiversity damaged um, you know, more than 60% of our species that have gone extinct in the last 50 years as a result of kind of human action. So all of that is, is really bringing home that we need to radically shift the ways that we are growing and developing our societies. And everybody is impacted. There isn't a place on this planet that is not impacted. Um, but this is where I want to again emphasize the however. One is we don't know how Mother Earth is going to balance herself. And she has, I have a faith in the planet of having a, a, an incredible regenerative healing capacity as well. But we need to work with her um, so we make, to make it possible for her. The problem is that some of those changes are happening so quick that, like, for example, many of the crops, they, they just can't adjust so quickly to the, the, the climatic changes, which is putting pressures on our food security, etc. Yeah. Um, so that's the balancing aspect. How is Mother Earth going to balance herself? How is she going to heal herself? What's happening? But now the, the next aspect is, look, our human consciousness is part of the planetary consciousness. So what is that doing to the human psyche as well? And this is again, where I think it's really important that as a humanity, we become really aware and conscious and rather than taking it into a you know, depression and going on a suicide mission, um, the way I see this trajectory of our evolutionary development, now let's just take a really, really big perspective here. If we're looking at the evolution of species, and this is not just for the human species, we can see the same pattern for the species. If a species grows in complexity, so it can grow in complexity because it becomes more diverse or becomes uh, greater in size and yeah, greater in impact. But so as a humanity, in the beginning of 1800, we were only with 1 billion people. Look now where we are. We are with what's it, 7.6 billion people. We are heading towards by, by 2050. Um, you know, we are heading towards 9 billion people. So I think we're already huge. at eight. I heard that we we're hit. now already at eight. Well, there you go. I heard that. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. So we're adding 7 billion people in such a short period of time on this planet, in addition to the ways that we are, we are living and we are growing. So what's important to put, to emphasize here is if a species, when it grows so much more complex, doesn't take its next step in evolutionary development and evolutionary development means that that species rather than killing each other for resources rather than competing each other for resources learns to collaborate for resources unless elizabeth saturi is an amazing evolutionary biologist and she's written a lot about that yeah? so if we don't take that step what we see with species is that there is a different pattern that activates and that's the pattern of self-destruction so we could say that in some ways, if we're looking at all the violence, all the divisions, the shootings, that it might well be that this self-destruct pattern has already started to activate. So it's like we are now seeing all these different scenarios playing out. So we have some uh, human beings <laughs> are fully trapped into this self-destruct pattern. So that's the trajectory. So they're kind of on that collapse trajectory, self-destruction, still wanting to ride out that domination. But yet we have also a growing number of people um, who are saying, no, 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 that is not my identity. That is not my humanity. And 
And they are deciding, they are part of that maturation, they're deciding on purpose, intentionally, and also systemically now to collaborate and to co-create and to coordinate resources and truly working on different economic systems, different eco ecological systems, different political systems, social systems. And what I've seen in, in that part of the narrative is that group of people is growing stronger and it's starting to coordinate and it's becoming coherent in amazing ways. I mean, I've been part of these experiments of these new systems for the last two decades. But what I'm seeing the last two years in the way that this is picking up and the way that we can talk about it in the mainstream, even my own PhD research, which was at a very conventional university in the Netherlands, Maastricht University, what I could talk about and research into the heart of systems change would have been unheard of even uh, a decade ago. So that trajectory to me is not a trajectory of, well, we're trying to still keep our head above the water despite the collapse. No, it's actually a new pattern. It's emerging new pattern and it's emerging new narrative. And I see that trajectory not so much of, okay, we have either really bad collapse, kind of middle way collapse, <laughs> and then maybe, you know, it's still coming out. Of, no, I, I'm seeing that scenario of this emerging new pattern of the maturation of our species. I'm seeing that activating from the future and reaching us into the now. So it's like it's doing this. So we have the collapse scenarios in different degrees. Uh, that's that past future again, some really, really bad, some perhaps, you know, still manageable, uh, and then we could say perhaps fairly livable. But there's this, these are these future scenarios of who we are choosing to become, of what people actually are experiencing uh, in their hearts, in their dreams of something else that's calling them forth. And, and that is not just, um, you know, a nice spiritual vision, wonderful values, but with no grounding. I'm talking about real pioneering work that's happening. <laughs> um, and, and that's what I'm seeing is that that's picking, that's picking up and that's touching base on that collapse scenario. And my, my own intuitive sense about this is let's take that middle way, that middle scenario of collapse when this pathway from the future into now of the next step of our maturation, when that becomes coherent, now this starts to serve as an attractor and it can actually lift that whole collapse scenario up and form the critical bridge that we need to create in order not to go extinct as a species. That's really good. It's very encouraging, actually. Um, like when you first started talking, you said, well, how is Mother Earth going to rebalance herself? And my yes. first thought was, well, she just has to get rid of us because we're the ones who are <laughs> throwing it out of balance, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, it would be nice if we could cooperate with Mother Earth, Mother Nature, and, yes. um, and stick around. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. stop. Uh, because Learn. I think, yeah, it's kind of a, I think, rare to have a, uh, such a beautiful habitable planet. I mean, uh, we haven't found yes. any other ones yet, although I'm sure they're out there, but uh, they're not just like, you know, really common. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the shame if we, as Buckminster Fuller used to call it, spaceship Earth. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. So, yes. and yeah. obviously, I mean, given up on us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, but it's a fascinating thing that you just explained yes. because obviously we can see the destructive thing happening. Like you said, the heat yes. waves, like right now, the whole Western United States is over a hundred degrees, which is up around 40 degrees centigrade and, uh, yes. you know, fires and all, and such droughts that the, the reservoirs are practically empty and all this stuff. And we yes. think, well, what's going to happen? And, you know, like Pakistan totally flooded about a third of the country is flooded and, uh, uh, one in seven people in the country is homeless right now and that's yes, out of millions yeah. of people so i mean we can go on and on with examples like yes. that um so you, you look at that and you think oh we're screwed you know this is really dire and uh, how is it possibly going to turn around and you know people like greta thunberg have been and al gore before her and have been warning us about tipping points and now we're reaching yes. and greater and greater yeah, rapidity yeah yeah yes but and, but I, you know i've always had this optimistic thing going on which is that you know, there's this much subtler, but actually much more powerful um, 
awakening taking place all over the world, uh, awakening of consciousness. And you just really explained very nicely how it's not just a sort of a, a beautiful subjective experience, but it's it's manifesting as practical steps that people are taking um, to turn things around. So yes, it's hopeful. Yes, and 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 remember, when you have all these climate extremes, let's talk about heat right now. Uh-huh. Heat in a system that is not coherent becomes destructive. Yes, that's so great because it's a lot of added energy. And the energy now is not embodied in a system, so it starts to go haywire. However, heat in a system that is coherent can actually help lift that consciousness. Hmm. Can you give us an example of such a system? Well, take your own body, for example. (laughs) Um, So say that a a, a yogi, one who has practiced really working with that inner fire, yeah, Mm -hmm. Um, doesn't collapse in a fever but takes that heat now <laughs> to go into a, a, an enlightened state of consciousness. So this yeah. yogi would have practiced that a very, very long time. We have hardly, in my opinion, begun to work with all of that trapped heat. We have not gotten really creative. So instead we are trying to control the situation. You have to now control to manage it to fight this is so first it was the war on on COVID, then it's the war on on climate change no <laughs> that's not that's not going to help us we need to find ways actually of how can we really now work with all of that fire is is in alchemy it's the resource you need for transformation yeah, yeah. so we had so when you say work with trapped heat like we were just talking about the heat waves in europe and the united states and India had a really bad one earlier this year. Are you t- literally talking about that heat, kind of harnessing it somehow, or are you speaking more metaphorically? Both. So both. What are the technologies in which we can be developing and working with all of that heat rather than trying to find it? Yeah. Um, what are ways to work? So I think that we are at the forefront, talking about the Renaissance again, of whole new technologies also, whole new developments that we have hardly began to, to imagine. Um, but And that there needs to be also market support for. But at the same time, it's also about our consciousness. We have not really, as a humanity, tapped truly the powers of our consciousness. Now, I've always had a lot of respect for the Australian Aborigines. I lived for eight years in Australia. And, and the conditions that they were able to live in, even in desert conditions, were astonishing. Yeah? Mm. I know that's a far call. <laughs> I'm not saying that everyone now has to become a yogi in order to work with climate change. But when you're impacted by that heat, if you don't know how to harness this and work with it, heat can otherwise also in our own mental health conditions lead to more violence, more to depression, more agitation, uh, you know, sleeplessness. So it's also we as a humanity have to adapt to these changing conditions in rapid ways and just taking it out, being angry with the state of the world, being angry and upset that the old normals are gone, that's not going to help us. So to me, it's also about saying a call of learn to adapt where you can and mitigate also, of course, the conditions where you can. But again, get creative with this. And I really don't think that we have tapped fully into the power of our collective consciousness and what a collective, coherent humanity, uh, how that's related also, uh, and might be interacting with the planetary consciousness. And maybe these are, might be the, some of the new consciousness technologies. I know HeartMath and the Global Coherence um, Research, you know, they were doing fascinating research on this as well, you know, to seeing what, what can happen in, in these pockets of coherence. So just putting that out there as some other ways to get creative, to start thinking about, you know, we are not separate from the planet. And um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you just mentioned heart math. Um, I want to make sure people heard that word. Um, yes. Yeah. On the one hand, I mean, there are certain temperatures above which people cannot live, and they're, you know, mm-hmm. 125 degrees or so, and, and cities which are reaching those temperatures now. And, and, you know, the only way you can live is to have air conditioning, but then that creates more greenhouse gases, <laughs> puts more strain on the electrical grid. Um, but I mean, we can go into all those pessimistic yes. reflections but but there are actually some really cool inventions coming up um That's like it. there was this like 
I just read this article about the 17 year old kid that's developed an electric engine that doesn't require all the really rare um, metals like lithium and all and uh, which are environmentally damaging to mine and uh, yes. could be you know manufactured much more cheaply and it's it's efficient I mean 17 year old kid um, and there are other things like that where people are just coming up with these these really interesting uh inventions and so that's a perhaps an example of uh, yes. a, a, a rise in consciousness that's taking place that's ripping yes. and it's not that this kid is a meditator or a con you know interested in consciousness but all you know rising tide lifts all boats and so if world consciousness is somehow rising then people are going to pop up here and there having all these great ideas and uh being able to put them into action that's it. And, and there, that's what I mentioned about coherence. Now imagine this kid learning about another child somewhere else or teenager and somewhere else. And now that becomes a coherent pattern of collaboration, of sharing, of um, helping each other to, to develop these new technologies, getting all that creativity together. Yeah, that's what I mean. So that there is also an incredible opportunity. Uh, I mean, the way I like to work with it sometimes is it's almost like taking a long, long perspective. Imagine we are at the end of this this century. Yeah. Who are who have we become as a result of this process from the people who are left behind then here in the care for our planet? How are they telling the story about this time right now? So putting ourselves as a future ancestor. How would you okay do that? Um put yourself there. How would you tell the story? Yes. <laughs> All of us, let's do that now. All of you who are listening as well. Just really like you to imagine yourself now after the after the big shift, after the big change, after the emerging new era, after this also the collapse of so many different systems. So imagine right now we've made it through. We've made it through. We may not be anymore with nine billion people. There will be far less of us. Yes. Well, imagine now what, what we have learned who we have become as people. And now imagine for a moment that we've come to finally, finally appreciate our planet for who she truly is. And remember that we can't do it without her. We are, we are part of her being, we are part of her consciousness. Now imagine that we're able to see and hear and experience and feel each other in ways that technology was alienating us from. Yeah. Imagine now that we have really learned to, to live with nature, to design our houses, our cities uh, with you know, drinkable water. The rivers have become drinkable water, that, that the air itself <laughs> is, is fully honored everywhere. So uh, imagine now that we've, we've truly become like a living cell uh, in this beautiful planetary consciousness. We as a species, have actually become planetary conscious and the collective consciousness is able to become conscious of itself in the human experience. We are also honoring and grieving um, the collapse and the death of so much, but what we are seeing now in, you know, at the end of the century, we've seen life return in places where we never thought it was possible. We've, we've seen the, the oceans have been healing themselves. We've, we've, we've realized as long as we've been creating the conditions for life to renew itself, it does, it does. We see nature popping up in places where we never imagined this possible. We, we've seen whole fields of life come back alive. Uh, and we realize now that the power of life it really should have been at the center of everything that we have always been doing. We've really become a new species, different species. That's beautiful. And you know, there's there's some nice examples of nature coming back very quickly when it's given the chance. For yes. instance, um, in Yellowstone National Park, at one point, all the wolves were killed because it was thought that yes. oh, wolves are bad. And the, and it really messed up the ecosystem. And then at a certain point, they, they realized, well, wolves belong here. So they started reintroducing wolves. And it, it resulted in this flourishing of the ecosystems and the streams and the other kinds of animals and everything, like a lot of things that had been going downhill revived fairly quickly. I don't know. That's just one example. I'm sure there are many others. Um, Yes. And as you were speaking, you know, I was thinking, well, 
people might be listening to that and thinking, well, well, that sounds nice, but it's so pie in the sky. It's very idealistic. And But then I thought, well, it's good to have a vision like that. I mean, you, you, you might think you're being realistic by thinking that we're going to be living in a dystopian world, uh, you know, 50 or 80 years from now. But actually, if we envision uh, a more heavenly world, we'll probably yeah. stand a better chance of, of creating it. Yes. <laughs> I mean, look at all, all of the inventions that we have. Somebody thought about that and said, well, why not? <laughs> why not? Yeah, yes, yeah. It comes also. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Because you see, this, this collapse scenario, mm, you can't change that by just agreeing with it. <laughs> Yeah, we're just True. going, going, yeah, going down into into. In fact, it actually will make things much worse because if people just believing, well, it's a done deal. <laughs> There's nothing much that we can do about it. That's that's not true. Right, you right become now, cynical and and defeatist, and you know, yes, give yes. up. And and also, what I often like to remind people of, I know globally they're still talking about let's cap it at 1.5 degrees but we know of course with the science that we are already heading you Past know that. for for far far more yeah and that even with delays in the system two degrees warming is practically guaranteed but however every action is required now to make sure we're not escalating to through three or four degrees everything that we're doing everything that we're doing today will make a difference between are we taking those worst collapse scenarios? Are we are we going to have to adapt to life on on planet Earth here, that worst scenario, or that middle one, eh? <laughs> uh, or a little bit higher one? So it's really important to to remember that that all the emissions that we're putting out every single day by the way that we live and by the way that we we produce, by the way that we consume. Uh, is adding to one of those scenarios. So right now we have to prevent at all costs that we are escalating towards three or four degrees warming. That is in our power to stop. That is in our power. And it's our responsibility to stop that. It's actually now, thankfully, countries are recognizing some of them that it's a constitutional responsibility to stop, to stop that at all costs. We owe that to the future generations as well as our ancestors. Look at what so many of our ancestors have given for us to to have this opportunity of of being human. And uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I guess the tr what comes to my mind is that unfortunately, a lot of people won't change unless they're forced to, and mm -hmm. um, and then they also or unless they're offered some alternative that's so much better than than what they have mm -hmm. so for instance you know we talk about phasing out coal in the united states and yes. and then people you know the politicians start screaming about the the coal miners losing their jobs um and so then nothing happens or but but if uh you know if the coal miners could be offered a much better job uh that paid better and that didn't require being underground yes. all day yes. um you know like maybe building wind turbines or solar panels or something like that uh, then okay, that sounds better. I won't get black lung disease, and I'm I'm earning twice as much money, and you know. Um, but uh, unfortunately, again, it still seems that you know very often people have to have their their town burned down or their you know their or get flooded out before they really take it seriously. And a lot in, in the U.S. at least, I don't know about Europe, but in the U.S., a lot of politicians still deny that that climate change is a problem. Um, or that, that, that it's caused by sunspots, maybe, or that we can't do yeah. anything about it. Um, <laughs> Let's blame it on something else. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Surely humans have nothing to do with that. So yeah, we can right. keep business as usual. <laughs> yeah, there's people who you can see websites yeah. where they're arguing that it's not caused by humans. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and you can yeah. also see websites that argue that the earth is flat. So. <laughs> yes, exactly. And 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 often when you bring down a narrative, it's quite easy to de debunk a lot of those stories. You know, they will yeah. say, okay, there's no there's no warming in the atmosphere. And then you have to ask them, where are you measuring? High up or below? <laughs> yeah, it yeah, yeah. wasn't too long yeah, ago okay. that um, one time there was a, just a few years ago, there was a snowstorm in Washington, D.C. And, yes. and one, of the, one of the congressmen came in with a snowball and said, look, God, global warming, what a joke. There's a, here's a snowball. <laughs> 
<laughs> but and that's 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 where I mean, climate scientists got thankfully a bit smart about the narrative. But the, the first symptom of climate change is not global warming, but climate extremes, weather global extremes. Weirding. Yes. So you have extreme cold periods as well as extreme heat. So anybody was saying, well, you see, you know, a, a global warming, so there's no climate change. No, <laughs> yeah. the fact that you have a snowball at a very old time is actually a sign that, you know, of, of climate change. But yes, uh, you know, going back, uh, <laughs> of course, also to your earlier point, how, hmm, what is it about human behavior that unless we are forced to change very often, we, we don't, yeah? Uh, and then I come back again also to the, the maturation of our species and good leadership. And I think there's a lot of very bad leadership. Um, and, and that is, we really need very, you know, future forward thinking, transformative evolutionary leadership right now. But also for people, people become very lazy, if I may uh, say so. You know, it's, it's like they... We, We've had this kind of lazy attitude towards democracy. Oh, I'm going to, if we even vote, vote for somebody, and then that's their responsibility to take care of. So we've externalized so many things that this person will fix that, that person will fix that, that technology will do that. Well, maybe there's a deeper wisdom in what comes crashing down right now. Perhaps all this externalization, all this subcontracting out has made us poorer inside as people. And right now, as we are realizing that the way that we've externalized all of that and outsourced all of that isn't working, it's it's making us sluggish for the change. It's making us lethargic. It is putting us to sleep like a frog that's being warmed very, very slowly and it won't jump. Yeah. So another way to look at that is that life is saying, wake up, reclaim your power. Remember again your powers as human beings. Yeah? You can make the change, but it's, it's, it's about starting from within. Systems change begins within. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I think there's a deeper wisdom in here. And yeah, that's where I put my trust. Yeah. And I guess, you know, you could, you could view the climate catastrophes that ha are happening as wake-up calls. Um, mm -hmm kind of like the you know the old testament where you know the pharaoh wouldn't listen and and yes. so okay now have frogs and okay now have locusts and <laughs> okay now every you know all these kids are going to die and, you know until he finally said all right all right i got it <laughs> but um <laughs> but I, I don't know it's like well hearkening back to what you were saying earlier about mother earth and how she's going to rebalance yes. um you know it's all this stuff that's happening to me is it's wake up calls, all the, the, the dire circumstances. And, you know, people are seeing it on the news, even if it's not impacting them directly. And I don't know, it, it seems like it's, maybe you know better than I, but it seems like it's getting through to people and laws are, are changing and policies are changing. Like in California, for instance, they've said, yes. okay, at, after 2035, no more internal combustion engine cars can be sold here. And uh, and now seventeen other states are saying the same, you know, considering the same thing, and yes. so you know, slowly but surely, I, and you know, in case people are wondering, what does this conversation have to do with spiritual development? Because that's what this show is about. Yes, I, I it's kind of implicit in what we're saying, but maybe we should make yes. it more explicit. But I, I really feel like the you know spiritual development of humanity is inextricable trickably linked with the environment, the, the society at large, everything that's happening is a symptom of our collective consciousness. And, you know, we need to do things on all levels to solve problems. But if we don't raise our collective consciousness by having enough of us raise our individual consciousness, no matter what we try to do on more manifest levels, we won't be successful. Yes. And, and another thing is that the way to raise consciousness, it's not just about sitting in meditation and going, oh, no, nothing is affecting me. <laughs> right. That can really take you into a trip, right? It but can. It's taking, raising consciousness can also mean begin with your own household. Mm -hmm. 
what appliances are you using what is your emissions what's the ecological footprint of your own life yeah what are you what are you doing for the planet um how are you greeting the birds uh, how, how are you making life possible in your own little garden uh, how are you if, if you're leaving say for example in an apartment could you at least put some plants there <laughs> yeah how are you bringing nature back into your life what are you doing also for nature where are you putting your vote how are you voting with your money, with your wallet? You know, what are you supporting? Uh, what questions are you asking in areas where there is human rights violation, nature rights violations? How are you raising your voice? How are you being an advocate for the change? So I think this is really also the time, and this is also where I think a lot of women are at the forefront of this, is about you want to raise consciousness, put it into action uh be the change that we wish to see this is no longer just a time about um seeking some form of enlightenment out and away from the planet yeah? it's about embodiment <laughs> yeah really em embody your soul potential what it means to 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 be that that spirit in physical form and to me spirituality is also about really understanding that the fundamental unity of life that life is interdependent and that means that we are all in it we're all of this going through this change together and we need everyone on board to to help create a livable future we've been manifesting in many ways un unconsciously a, a lot of patterns that perhaps many people on their own didn't want or never thought that would even be possible but we are with so many <laughs> uh yeah and then the, the the cumulative effects but yeah i really feel that it's about bringing the spirituality back here into your heart into your hands into your feet walk the path be the path be the change be the systems that make life possible yeah that's great um yeah it's what you said about you know people just sort of meditating and going off into their own little <clears throat> dream bubble of, of bliss and ignoring the world there yeah. there obviously that is a syndrome um in many cases uh but i don't think it really represents the full blossoming of spirituality that, that, that some of the greatest spiritual leaders have exemplified and exactly. and recommended i mean you see people like mahatma gandhi or sri aurobindo or um, I don't know, Jesus, who, who were very concerned about what was happening to people and whether they were being fed and whether they had their, you know, rights and, and things like that. Um, they weren't content to just marinate in their inner bliss. Um, and, you know, pers I was, personally, I think that enlightenment, whatever we want to, whatever word we want to use, is a holistic development that um, doesn't just involve a nice subjective experience but that um is fully integrated with an enriching of all of yeah. the um manifest or expressed values of life so really really one because well you talk about becoming a future human to me a future human yes, is is somebody who is fully developed in you could say 100 percent material 100 percent spiritual yes well yes and and going if you know marry that with what some of the you know groundbreaking new insights from a new paradigm in science and consciousness and what that research is showing is that matter itself is a form of consciousness yeah so that the old divide between okay we have matter and we have spirit that's falling away <laughs> there's a whole new understanding of matter and this is i think that when we really dive into that really understanding that matter itself is a particular state of consciousness yeah then we go deeper into the cosmological architecture the informational architecture and there we find the ways now to truly create economic political social systems that by design are transformative that are coded for the evolutionary process you know to me that is the future that i wake up for which i've i've always felt and sensed it's in such precision and detail is is really possible is is when i think of the end of this century that is what i'm experiencing and and that is not fake it's really as i said it's really precise and detailed for example i've been applying that in 
um, seeds constitution, so as a whole constitution with algorithms, with digital currencies, with um, hundreds and hundreds of people around the world. It's a global platform for creating new regenerative economic and financial systems. Yeah? And when you're working on that, from that vision, from that future human potential, it is amazing the, the detail in, in which um, when you're working with living systems, it actually shows itself of you know, what to emphasize, what feedback loop to create, what algorithm to create, and to, to make visible what for a long time people thought, oh, that's spirituality out there. So it's about, to me, it's about finding this spirit in matter, in the very heart of matter. When you find that there, that whole duality, that whole division falls away. I mean, you really are then operating from a completely different paradigm and a different possibility. That to, that's what I feel we are at the forefront of. And that is what's being accelerated because we have to. <laughs> if, we, if we don't take that step, <laughs> Well, how do we, you know, then nature will say, you look, <laughs> humanity, interesting experiment, but guess what? You're not graduating. Yeah, nice try. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I have an ongoing debate with a, a group of friends who, you know, some of them are on my side, some of them are on, on the side of consciousness is just produced by the brain and you don't survive physical death and uh, there's no such thing as reincarnation and all kinds of things like that. And, you know, I, I'm seeing it from the flip side is that, you know, like you just said, matter is consciousness, you know, yeah. kind of uh, accreted or precipitated into apparent physical form. And I think uh, that the fact that this materialist paradigm has been so predominant could be blamed. Uh, we, we could attribute to that all the um, mess that the world is in, you know, because if we see the world as dumb stuff, what does it matter yeah. what, what you do to dumb stuff? It's dumb. It doesn't know. <laughs> but if we see yeah. everything is imbued with consciousness, with intelligence, with life, then, you know, whatsoever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. Uh, in other words, you, you just become acutely sensitive to the, the aliveness of every little thing. And, you know, exactly. you, you, you would no more harm it than you would, you know, slice your own hand or something. Yes. And, and in addition to that, and this is what I, th I find really exciting for human development, when you become aware of this consciousness as a field and how your own consciousness is part of that and how consciousness is fundamental, what happens is now that instead of operating from your own little human intelligence system, you learn to actually extend your human capacities with the fields of consciousness around you and living systems. Mm -hmm. So now what you have available to your capacity <laughs> is so much more. Yeah, I used to be in the TM movement, you know, and, and we used to have yeah. these, these campaigns where we would go to a place, like I spent three months in Iran uh, just before the revolution. And um, we were attempting to sort of enliven the field of consciousness in that area or in various other places people went so that there didn't have to be outright warfare that somehow transitions could be you know lubricated and made more smooth and there was a lot of research on it and they they did find that the you know presence or absence of these groups had a measurable impact on you know, various social indicators and war deaths and, and all kinds of things like that. So the idea of consciousness is, is a field is, as a field is very exciting. And I was thinking of that earlier when you were speaking and, yeah. you know, Rupert Sheldrake's um, morphogenetic yes, field morphogenetic. ideas and, and how very often good ideas come popping up simultaneously yes. in, in various people who had no communication with one another, because that idea was lively in the field and ready to, ready to pop. And that's right. Because, and, and again, here, this is what all of us were listening here, participating in this conversation. You are part of the maturation of the field dynamics that make new innovations, new technologies, new ways that, you know, life centered ways yeah. possible. And it's, yeah, we have and to it's, shift how we think. About it's so that. important, this field idea. We should emphasize it because. Yes. If there, if consciousness were not a field, and if if you know we only communicate by you know sending emails or watching the news and stuff like that, everything is just so fragmented and disconnected. But if consciousness is a field, then again, it's like rising tide lifts all boats. Um, there's a, a field that permeates the whole world that is rising, and it's going to lift 
everyone. I mean, if a boat insists upon keeping itself anchored to the bottom, the boat mm. may, ca may capsize because the water is going to yes, go up. Exactly. But, but if they're willing to rise, um, it's yes. it, the whole world could be uplifted um, in yes. in a way that we don't anticipate or most people don't. And that's another thing. I mean, my research has been for a long time on living systems. Yeah? That's mm -hmm. also my PhD research. But I found fascinating is that when there is damage or harm in a living system, at the same time, there's an imaginal influx of consciousness that comes forth within the system that is essential for its capacity to renew and to evolve, which is again about understanding the field dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, so, also, again, if we are capturing that imaginal capacity of life itself that's influx i mean look at your say that you're injured part of your skin on your on your hands there's a your your body is actively sending all this intelligence forward here to heal and repair itself yeah so there is a lot of there's a lot of damage to the planet but what we are not seeing because it's invisible to so many is how life in its living systems ecosystems is regrouping reorganizing itself and how there is an influx of imaginal capacity at that time hence also the renaissance in, 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 in increased dreams visions inspirations that is part of life's response <laughs> to renew itself and to heal itself from the harm. If we capture that now, we capture that influx of imaginal consciousness, imaginal capacity, we capture that, and we put that into these new designs, into these new structures, into these new systems, into these ways that we're creating the new narratives and new movements. There are amazing things that are possible. However, if we don't capture it, and we let it be hijacked, this imaginal potency, by those who are preaching to the divisions, the uh, the violence, the going back into warfare, uh, you know, then we have missed just an incredible, incredible opportunity. So, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's a really good. Um, it's not. It's it's more than a metaphor because it's literal. I mean, the way the planet yes. tries to heal itself. Um, yes, and uh, it's fascinating. And and if we think of it, the planet as being like a body and what what a body does when there's an injury or an infection or, or something like that maybe we can elaborate on this a little bit more um yes i mean you know obviously the uh, you have white blood cells coming and they're uh, what do they do they they kind of try to you know uh, gobble up the the, the they clean up <laughs> yeah, exactly they take away the all the the dead cells and yeah. <laughs> So, yes. uh, so on and a global scale, right. maybe we have something that behaves as white blood cells, and then there are yes. other things which bring in nourishment. And I don't know. Like, and exactly. like, take a specific example. Let's say, um, so the invasion of Ukraine. Um, yeah. What are what are we supposed to do? I mean, should we just well, say, you know, all right, you know, we're not going to fight. Let, let Putin take Ukraine, or do you think it's right to, um, you know? send arms to Ukraine so they can try to defend their territory? Or should everybody just sort of go around and come, come to Ukraine and chant OM all day? Or, you know, <laughs> what would you suggest, like with a concrete example like that? Well, first of all, look at the immune response of humanity when it, Ukraine was invaded and how it was different from other other invasion stories before. Yeah. Many people felt it as if it happened to them. Right. In standing with solidarity, I mean, look also how Europe uh, opened its arms to all of the, the refugees. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, so there, the immune response reaction towards e Ukraine getting invaded by Putin, and it's people feeling it even in the United States as if it's happening now to them, shows me that there's already the emerging again of this this collective awakening of this collective consciousness as a humanity. Something has shifted in this. And I think it's absolutely important that we stand in solidarity with Ukraine um, in order to stop these patterns of invasion and domination and aggression yeah, that uh, Putin is now uh, not only playing out, but taking opportunity. Right. And he's not going to stop 
he's not going to stop in Ukraine. I mean, right. Uh, I mean, if he could get away yeah. with that, he might try Finland or something or whatever. Oh, and, and don't forget, <laughs> don't forget uh, Russia's uh, influence in Africa, where we are feeling in here. So, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the war is shifting in, in, in many different ways as well. So the way that we keep democracy alive also is, is by taking responsibility for it every single day again we can't just expect oh because we signed it in our constitutions or again we're coming back to we voted for somebody no it's our responsibility to keep this alive and part of keeping what makes democracies vulnerable to people like putin is because it's these are open societies mm -hmm. um and therefore we have a different immune response a different defense system so to say and we are having to learn now what is our um, immune response, learning response uh, towards somebody like Putin, who has no respect for human life whatsoever, is, 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 is willing to lie. <laughs> he just wants to achieve his goal. He wants to just have, have another, you know, Soviet Union. Yeah. If we don't stop those patterns and we don't stop that, um, then these archetypes of domination um, are terrorizing people. So it, it's really important. Yeah, I feel. Yeah. There's that saying, it takes a thorn to remove a thorn. Um, even even, yes. even Ramana Maharshi liked that phrase. And, yes. um, you know, sometimes it takes military um, opposition to you know, confront a, an aggressor. Yeah. Um, yes. That you can't just, yes. I mean, Gandhi was actually saying, oh, you know, we shouldn't like fight Hitler, try passive, you know, try Satyagraha, passive nonviolence. And uh, yes. it just wouldn't have worked in that case. Sometimes you just have to, you know. Sometimes you have to match it. Ex exactly. Yeah. But then it's, we need, of course, also have very clear agreements that say that we, ha we have to match it, have to stop the aggression how to make sure that the people who are in charge of stopping that aggression are not staying and becoming the next aggressors. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. And that's always the risk, because that means that even democracies may choose moments of being more authoritative in order to, to, to stop that domination. But if they're not conscious themselves at that moment of the power, the increased power that they're using, they may become the next dominator. And that's the big risk uh, in, in crisis management. Yeah, I have a question here. Maybe just pop this yes. in, and then I have some other thoughts to, to pursue. <laughs> uh, this yeah. is a question that came in from Tiffany Adair in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I love the idea of imagining life after the big shift happens. She capitalized the word shift, but I can't help but think about how much people need to change to get there, from lifestyles to old cult cultural values, traditions, politics, etc. What do you suggest when we encounter someone who is opposed to this shift for any reason, such as being afraid of change, greed, lower consciousness, et cetera? Oh, that's a very good question. I always like to start with where there's a little opening and find that opening in a person um, and build a bridge from that. Because if you go confrontational and if you go, well, try to convince the other person, you, all you get is resistance. So for example, uh, now ask them, um, as a future ancestor of, of a world that's not yet born, which world do you want to be a part of? Yeah. Uh, which world, if you were to tell the story later in your life, or even if this was the last day of your life, yeah, how would you want to people to tell the story about what you and your life have done? And now imagine that every little change that you're making could inspire someone else and that could inspire someone else yeah. i'll tell you um, a practical example here this is in one of the um, the classes i was giving on ecological literacy for the students in mauritius and one of the girls was saying well, well look at us you know what if our island here disappears and we haven't even um you know done so much to give rise to all of these emissions we're not even responsible that's what you're saying for the climate crisis but our island may be disappearing and it may be common livable for here. And it's all just so unfair. And what can I do on this small little island to make any change? 
And as we started to work on our school projects on ecological literacy and taking actions to save the, the, the water and the ocean and help with the pollution, and we created campaigns where we cleaned up <laughs> uh, many of the plastic bags all around, and we started to put that, all of those plastic bags into art for awareness. Now, I started to document that story and tell that story. And that story actually then went to Syria and Syria was just uh, at starting to emerge in their own civil war uh, at the beginning. And one of the students in Syria, uh, she was uh, a student of mine as well. And we started to now link to st the stories. And, and suddenly the, the children in Mauritius and them taking action for the planet and learning to work together and creating teams and feeling that at least there was something they were doing about it. Yeah? Even if they felt they were not responsible for the disasters, they were doing something about it. That now started to inspire the children who are going to school in Syria in extreme conditions. And as the children in Mauritius were learning about the children in Syria, they went, whoa, it can be so much worse. Thankfully, we're not in a civil war. <laughs> yeah? uh, and so they, all of those stories started to amplify each other's and this is, you know, if when somebody's telling, well, I'm very pessimistic, we have to change so much, and, you know, I, I don't believe in any of this. The world is full with stories of people just taking a little action because they believe in it, because they believe that that's what's in the heart, what they need to do, that then starts to catalyze the change process of someone else and someone else and someone else. And before you know it, we're creating a social tipping point for the good changes rather than the destruction. It's nice. It reminds me of a story from the Indian tradition um, where the seagull laid its eggs on the sand. And uh, after a while, a wave came and washed the eggs out into the ocean. And the seagull said, give back my eggs, you know, and the, the ocean ignored it. And so the seagull said, OK, I'm going to make you dry if you don't give back my eggs. So it started taking water beak in its beak and you know taking it out of the ocean dumping it uh, on the sand taking it out like that over and over again and it just persisted day and night it had such determination uh i'm gonna it, it believed that it could do this and um obviously it wasn't going to succeed but the king of the birds whoever that might have been <laughs> garuda or something uh became, became aware of this little seagull and what it was doing and it was so inspired by its dedication that it, it came and you know being the king of the birds it had the ability to suck up the whole ocean if it wanted to and the ocean seeing the king of the birds comes in, okay okay i'm giving back the eggs and so it gave back the eggs but i mean the the principle there is i think that if we have the sincerity and the determination there are higher powers in this universe or perhaps a ultimate higher power uh which responds when we you know, there's that saying, God helps those who help themselves. So when we put forth the, the dedicated effort, some much greater force can come to our assistance and accomplish things that we alone might not have been able to. I agree with you. Yeah, and that's a beautiful story. I love that. And also, of course, that, you know, to me, ultimately, it always comes back to who are you going to be in these difficulties? What humanity are you giving birth to? So take the actions because you believe in that, you know, you believe in the goodness because that's how you're keeping love and wisdom alive in you. And even if you do that consistently in the most difficult circumstances, to me, that's heroic <laughs> in itself, you know, just keeping that love alive consistently, because as we do that and, and then generate that and then give that and share that with those people around us, we have no idea how much strength that can give um, and how important that can be. You know, we should never underestimate the value of that. Yeah. Jesus said, if your faith is as, as much as a grain of mustard seed, yeah. you can move mountains. That's <clears> it. <throat> the mountains of cynicism. Then we can move the mountains of cynicism. <laughs> yeah. Um, another yes. thing that came to mind as you were speaking earlier was um, the disinformation that flies around the world these days. And I was reminded of it because a lot of it comes out of Russia. I mean, they have whole buildings full of people just pumping out, you know, propaganda and disinformation and fake news and, and all kinds of stuff. And um, somehow 
I, 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 we'll see what you want to say about this, but I think one thing is that people really have to develop strong bullshit detectors, you know, strong uh, discriminative ability in this day and age. And there's another thing that, that's coming along these days, which is called deep fakes, where they can make videos of somebody like, I don't know, Tom Cruise or Barack Obama or somebody else that looks exactly like them. And you think it's them, but it's not them. It's just something that looks like them actually saying whatever they want them to say. So with the, the way that technology is evolving, the world is going to become even more confusing than it already is with, with this kind of thing going on. Any thoughts on you know, that? This is yeah, this is a very important point that you're raising. And I think, and it's interesting again, because we talked about before, when you externalize all of your powers and you give it away, you become poorer inside. Yeah. Mm. And the dangers of that in the time in which we're living now. So here is the beauty again, coming back to consciousness. When you really connect with life and information around you from that fundamental level of consciousness, you can sense if something is congruent or not. So you may not have the technology at that time to be even to be able to recognize this is a deep fake, is this going on, what's going there. But at a deeper level of reality, you can sense whether the information, what is the intention behind the information? What is the impact of this information? Is this information being sent into humanity in order to bring us together? and to, to bring up the, the values of the human heart that are going to make us stronger together? Or is that sent to um, divide us, um, to break us apart, to, you know, so that we start infighting and, and, and feeling that very pattern of the self-destruction that we talked about? So this is to me where this discernment comes in. It's really now using the power of your consciousness linked with the wisdom of discernment. So using the power of consciousness, the ability to ask questions, the wisdom of discernment, and, and then to really take responsibility for what information, what dynamics do I choose to participate in, feed in, broadcast, share, invest in, uh, and, and really taking that home as that is my primary responsibility as a human being, rather than just putting the blame on, oh, well, it's it's all on the fake news and it's all of this, and then you can't know anymore, but it's, you know, mm. <laughs> no. <laughs> we have a bullshit detector <laughs> inside us, <laughs> you know, and-, and Or we have a potential like to, one anyway. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and that's the power of your own wisdom and your power of your own consciousness, where you can you can actually sense um, and use that discernment and ask the right questions and uh, not just believe everything that's coming at you. Yeah, very important. I mean, there was a whole phenomenon when the pandemic hit, where um, a, a phenomenon phenomenon that people called conspirituality, where spiritual mm -hmm. people in large numbers just got yes. kind of brainwashed by a lot of the misinformation that was flying about and shifted in their beliefs and orientations in very strange ways. Um, but I, I also want to just mention there's some interesting principles in physics in terms of um, superfluidity and superconductivity, mm -hmm. where um, these incredibly coherent, perfectly coherent systems, usually it's at very low temperatures. Um, there's something called the Meissner effect in this regard, where they become impervious to um, incoherence coming from the outside. They're able to maintain perfect coherence mm -hmm. despite the um, onslaught of incoherent influences. And, and, yes. and so there's some kind of analogy there for human consciousness becoming so coherent that you're, you're not influenced by the incoherence around you kind of reminds me of that Rudyard Kipling poem where you, you, you don't lose your head while everyone around you is losing theirs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So it comes back again also to you talking about the power of spirituality before, right? Um, right. Our training as human beings. I think this is this is another aspect of of uh, spirituality in action, <clears throat> wisdom in action, uh, consciousness in action, and um, yes. Let's see. Here's another and, question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Continue. Well, one thing as well is where where do you exist i want to ask people you know is is your level of existence only in terms of 
information that is coming to you? Or can you bring where you exist at a more fundamental level of reality it's itself. Uh, I think that's that's really important because otherwise we're going to get swapped in story after story after story. Uh, but um, who are we fundamentally? Yeah. yeah. Um, here's a question that came in from Rita. Yes. I usually tune in for more overtly spiritual conversations, but now I am coming from a place of fear and worry over possible dark days ahead in America. And I want to tell you, this is a welcome conversation. Thank you. Mm. Just a comment, but it's a nice one. That's nice. That is yeah. nice. Yes. Yeah, I think there yes. is a silver lining. Uh, and, you know, Tiffany's question yes. earlier about what can you do about people who um, is a, are opposed to this shift and so on. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you, it's not a funny story. There, I, I like to play this sport called pickleball, right? I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's the fastest growing sport in America. And recently there have been a couple of articles in, with titles like can pickleball save America? And the reason is, the reason is that, you know, when I play, I'm there with people who have completely different political orientations than I do. And oh, we're friends, we're having fun, you know, we're playing pickleball. So, um, and, and that was what these articles were talking about. It's bringing together some very odd bedfellows, so to speak, you know, unlikely um, groupings of people. So, and, and there are other things like that, where um, there are organizations which get, you know, Republicans and Democrats in the same room and, and get them right. to have conversations yeah. and befriend one another and so on and find common ground. And I think there's probably a lot more common ground among human beings than mm -hmm. we often think in, in this in this time of yes. great polarization. And yes. perhaps we need to make a more concerted effort to find it. That's it, what you just said, because a lot of the polarization to me that is manipulated. You know, um that is not natural there there are people who are benefiting by that polarization i mean it's take a bit if let's take a bit of a back perspective out i mean it's it's amazing that people would even identify themselves as i'm a republican or a democrat <laughs> and and that that identity which is let's take a historical perspective it's really young right <laughs> so honestly are you gonna let that get away and if you're together having to fight a bushfire or you in a major flood you're going to say well, there's a, there's a Republican uh, on the other side of the river, and no, we won't save them. Or there's a de Democrat over there saying, well, help, help, help. Well, no, we'll ask them first. Uh, what party are you voting for? Really? Yeah. <laughs> it's, to me, it's, <laughs> it's unthinkable. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's also important, I think, to go back to basic, you know, yeah. people, um, and, and really look at indeed what unites us. And that, we need each other right now. Yeah, that's a good example. You know, a lot of times when uh, there is some kind of a natural disaster, like a huge snowstorm or a yes. flood or something like that, um, you see people's hearts expand and you see just yes. people driving like hundreds of miles with their boat to, to rescue people in the flood. And they're not, in, you know, they're not checking their, their voter registration card to see what party. No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> that's all of that falls away so yeah. yeah that's why sometimes i feel how you can work creatively in a transformative way with crisis moments is just imagine ourselves all right right now in such a big flood as if it's happening now and then you, you you're not looking like you said somebody's voters registration yeah? how would you behave in the middle of a crisis when lives have to be safe well we're in that time right now even if it hasn't Kind of hit home uh and who are you going to be in that how are you going to reach out to people around you what are you going to do also to not just human life but you know our other the plant families the insects the, the bees that need our help you know are you going to show up for each other you need it right now there's so much goodness that you can do so please people if you think about all the goodness that we can do all the care that we can give why why focus on the well if they're not going to change then why should i you know it's just, it's just not not helpful yeah 
Yeah. Well, this is this is a point we could discuss a little bit more because I know that in yeah. Europe there's been huge waves of immigrants, and in the mm-hmm. U.S. Um, there are there's a constant flow of hundreds of thousands of people from Central and South America coming up to the U.S. Mexico border, and there's a it's a big political issue about you know what to do with them, yeah. and um, and with climate change, I mean if sea level rises a few feet. There could be a number. There could be hundreds of millions of people in coastal cities that are going to have to move, and yes. at, the, at the same time, there could be droughts and famines and all kinds of things going on. And so, a lot of people predict that there will be great social upheaval uh, with mass migrations of people, and and so that could, you know, we can envision a very, you know, contentious world if if all that begins to happen. On the other hand, we were just mentioning the point where. Uh, yeah. In natural disasters, sometimes people just become great humanitarians and their hearts open yes. up. So, yes. you know, you, you wonder, like, how is this going to play out? Well, that's it. And one thing as well, I think if, if we are over imagining and overplaying this in our head, we have to be careful as well, right? Uh, um, so, t- that's why to me, it's, if you take as a mantra for your own life, what action can I take today that helps to create a more livable world? Even the small actions, the little things that you can do, do that consistently. You know, practice calmness in the middle of the storm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, if you feel triggered, if you feel annoyed, if you feel like you really want to put someone else in that place or you want to convince them, you know, whatever, whatever your trigger points are, work with that. Because when you work with that every day, then when we are really in the midst of those crises, you may find that you are that person then that actually is really calm, that suddenly rises up and, and just can become that incredible arm for others. When you may even surprise yourself, but you prepare for that today. You prepare for that today in the way, in your attitude, the way that you develop it. Also your, how you work with challenges, um, and, and look at what undermines it. One of the, the first, I would, I would almost say it's emotional poison. What really undermines this is blame. When we start to, to blame, to put it out there, <laughs> that it's someone else's responsibility, and we start to feel really sorry for ourselves. Yeah? Um, where does that take you? It, it, it locks you in. It makes it impossible for you to, to really take proactive actions. So. And keep your inner consciousness really free, really clear. Um, we are in the tipping point times now, and everyone is needed here. We don't know how we are how we are going to work through this, but we are we're, we're going to work through this. We're, we're, we have to. Yeah. There's too much that depends on us right now, and yes. In 1974, I was on a boat ride on Lake Lucerne in Switzerland with Marishi Mahesh Yogi and a bunch of people. And we were all talking mm-hmm. about this thing that you and I are talking about today, this yes. phase transition that's going to happen in society. Yes. And, uh, you know, that was like 50 years ago, but <laughs> we were talking about it. And uh, people, you know, people were kind of worrying because it sounded like, oh, it could get rough. And they, they said, you know, they asked Marishi, well, how can we survive this? And he said, hold on to the self. That's it. You know, hold on. And he might capital uh, S self, you know, the sort of cosmic self. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's see now, where should we go from here? Do you have thoughts in the back of your mind of things that you like to talk about that we haven't considered yet or what? Well, let me ask you Uh (laughs) some questions. (laughs) Sure. <laughs> yeah. So well, what you're seeing in the United States and, you know, um, people from who are not living in the United States, like, my, like myself, when we're, it, it looks like um, there's really an, an untold level of polarization that's been happening in your own country, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and almost a call to renew your democracies in a way that, that many may not even you know, have thought of um, all of those years ago. What does it mean? The American spirit, the American heart, the American values, there was long this American dream that was tied to this economic dream of everyone can have the big house, the big car, the, you know, the big fridges and ice ice machines, right? (laughs) Making lots of ice cubes. (laughs) That's what I remember. And also when I came to the States, but there's something else in the pioneering 
pioneering spirit of Americans. So when you were to close your eyes or you would tell um, you know, the future generations about what it truly means, the heart of what it means to be an American and to be an American in times of great change, what are the values that really stand out for you? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, first of all, people came over here from Europe and it was a, a, con a con continent that was just incredibly rich with natural resources. And basically, wave after wave, we killed or isolated the people who were already living here and, uh, and started mm -hmm. to cash in on all these great resources. And, and then we began to tell ourselves, we're so wonderful, we're so successful, you, you know, we're, you know, look at us, aren't we, aren't we great? Uh, but I think, you know, if we had tried to do this in, in a desert, like the way Israel has managed to do, it might not have gone so well. Um, so there's, <laughs> there's that. But, you know, then again, maybe people who are willing to cross an ocean and to an unknown land have a certain pioneering spirit that is conducive to, uh, you know, uh, uh, inventiveness and entrepreneurial nature and, and all that. And so, you know, maybe there was that sort of breed of, of person that became known as American. Um, where am I going with this? So, well, it was firstly, we were gifted with a very great natural resource, you know, to, to begin with. And I think that the attempt at forming the government we uh, have formed was brilliant. Um, and has been challenged and has and we've been very hypocritical about it. I mean, all men are created equal. And yet a lot of the guys who wrote the De Declaration of Independence and the Constitution own slaves. Um, so there's been a lot of hypocrisy. But and, you know, it's I'm, I'm not really a political commentator, but so I should cut this short. But um, these days, things are, are very polarized, as you say. Um, it used to be that you know not that long ago when some bill would come up in in congress and there would be a you know majority of republicans and democrats voting for it these days it's 50 50 or just you know no vote republicans will vote or democrat will vote for a, a bill that the other party has proposed so we're very divided very polarized um people talk about you know, alternative facts, as if there were such a thing that they ascribe to as compared to what the other people think. 60% uh, of Republicans think that Trump won the last election and you can't convince them otherwise. Um, so whatever we're going through, we haven't finished going through it. And there's going to have to be a reckoning or a healing or a, uh, a unification somehow and I'm not sure exactly what's going to accomplish it. And a lot of people are predicting another civil war, but it will be much more grassroots and much more intermixed. It won't be so territorial if it happens. Uh, there are more guns in this country than there are people. And um, you know, even though there are hundreds of gun deaths just about every day, you, you know, the only response to these massacres we have is thoughts and prayers. And you can't accomplish anything to change the laws around gun ownership. So, well, you can tell I'm getting off on a, a rant here, a soapbox, but uh, did that help at all in terms of the question you asked me? <laughs> well, it raises, yeah, it raises uh, several <laughs> questions. It's actually very interesting because one of the first thing that, that comes to mind as I'm listening to you is really to, and I'd like to ask the American people, what's the root of this division? If you were to go all the way back in time, where did that begin? That would be the first question. What's really the root? What's the weed of all of that? And the second question is, what has made it so difficult for a third party, a third a middle ground, an alternative, a third way to be able to emerge? Why has that not been able to, to really to, to take off? So what has made it so majoritarian? I mean, I know you've, you've inherited an English system, which unfortunately is seeing the same in, in the United Kingdom, right? All of those majoritarian systems, they're set up dualistically rather than through coalitions. Um, but what is it within the American people where they somehow have bought in to say, well, that that is simply part of political life. And what do we need, what needs to happen for people to start imagine a very different kind of politics that isn't hijacked by two parties 
constantly giving themselves a standing by making the other person wrong. You know, yeah. a lot of politics is, is not about that game, but the politics of the future is truly about working together on the issues that require our collaboration. Yeah. Well, regarding the roots of the division, I'm not yes. sure, but it must be something in the collective consciousness. You know, there there must be some deep schism or, or division in the collective consciousness, and it, it probably will only be mended by uh, some kind of regeneration of consciousness at a deep level. Yes. That's, that's my conjecture. And regarding yeah. the two-party system, um, it is set up that way. And there have been other parties which have eventually ceased to exist. There were parties called like the Whigs and the, I don't know, there were mm -hmm. other parties. And um, there is something called ranked choice voting where, where um, it would allow for multiple parties and then everything would get filtered out and you know we'd end up with with something uh more interesting i think than what we currently have and you know as it is now there have been third party candidates like ralph nader and, and others but yes. they didn't really get anywhere um it's very often a symbolic thing where some will run on the vegetarian party or something like that but um i think perhaps there could it's hard to change anything you see because um people like their power and they, and they like the the they, they don't want a, a kind of a more eclectic mix up of of multiple mm -hmm. parties and so the guys that were and then we have the problem of corporations funding the politicians there are yes. ju just in terms of the pharmaceutical industry alone there are three lobbyists in washington for every politician and um so it's very po difficult to pass legislation on you know drug policies, drug prices and stuff. And that's just one industry. Then we have fossil fuels and everything else under the sun. There's this uh, American politics is a wash in money. And um, yes. the Supreme Court passed something about, a, I don't know, back during the Obama administration called um, Citizens United. And it was a thing where corporations were now to be regarded as people. And they mm -hmm. had the right to give any amount of money to politicians, even anonymously. There are ways of setting that up. So the, the system's really screwed up. And something's got to give. Something's got to change. And I don't know what's going to force it to. Um, we're just going to have to two, two things that come to my mind again uh, listening one is imagine this is a thought experiment imagine that every child at school in the united states gets asked <laughs> to envision a different political system a different society in which there are not democrats and republicans yeah? there are wonderful americans with also the older refugees immigrants and so there is a there are um, planetary citizens living in the United States <laughs> who are also part of other countries. So imagine that all the children at school are actually getting this as a project at school to start to imagine this. And how that in the back of their minds later when it's their time to either create jobs or take on positions, there's something about those early exercises that they've done that says, why are we putting up with a broken system? Let's create a better world, like Buckman's to Fuller set, you know. Mm. Um, let's really put our energy there. So imagine that being a school project that starts that seeding, planting that seed really by design intentionally. And that's one. And then the other thing that's just an observation is that any system that is inhibited from transforming and evolving itself uh, will start to do so through collapse and death. Mm -hmm. Because you can't stop nature <laughs> you can't you can't stop life in that way so if if life is being trapped in structures that can't evolve then eventually it just creates the very conditions for the collapse so if the united states is not going through this experiment to renew and evolve itself um and evolve even its its constitutional palace in that sense its own political system then you, you're setting yourself up actually for more of those collapse scenarios. So the, this, this, if for all of those people out there who are thinking, oh, well, this collapse is just happening because again of someone else or the companies, no, you, you're part of that. Uh, and you are also an imaginal cell within a society seeking to renew and evolve itself. And imaginal cells have given very very specific potencies by life itself so that there can be imaginal cells 
but just like it's in the butterfly, the imaginal cells of the butterfly. If in the caterpillar body, the imaginal cells of the butterfly don't link up in time, they can't form the butterfly body. And then that beautiful little creature dies. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. And I, th I think it's very, I mean, I think life is fun and, and I'd, I'd like to live, you know, until uh, I'm over a hundred, if I can, just to see what happens. <laughs> because, <laughs> because it's fascinating to watch it all unfold. And um, <laughs> obviously, you know, so many great civilizations have collapsed throughout history. Mm -hmm. And yes. when they were in their prime, they probably couldn't imagine that they would ever collapse. They would think, you know, we're, we're here forever. Um, and so who knows what's going to happen in, in the United States. Um, I, I don't know. I can only speculate. But, um, I, you know, again, I keep coming back to the fact, I mean, the very presence of this show that I'm doing and other shows yeah. like it, um, you know, there's so many people around the world who are waking up, you know, spiritually yes. and, and in many other ways. And I don't think so, even if we had the technology in the 1950s, I don't think I could have done a show like this because the collective consciousness was just not ripe for it. And exactly. of, of course, now we do have the technology, which in itself is a symptom of something beautiful happening. It was like this, yes. this nervous system has formed all over the world that, Definitely. you know, lets information propagate in ways it never could before. So, I don't know, your, your guess is probably not as good as mine, but better than mine as to how things are going to unfold, because <laughs> this has been your specialty. But I'm <laughs> ultimately, I'm optimistic, but I think that yeah. we could go through some rough times before we get to the yes. brighter future. Yes, I, I meet you in there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, because there's I, so many things that exist that wouldn't, <laughs> couldn't exist in a more enlightened world. And so how are those things going to transform or be dismantled or something? Yes. Well, we, we're also creating right now the very conditions for our own next step in evolution, right? Yeah. Um, you know, this is the compost. <laughs> but we also need to compost some of our belief systems and patterns and behaviors that are just dysfunctional. And be very aware of systems that were simply designed for collapse and never designed to make to last. So, you know, allow to die, allow to let go, uh, allow to release. Yeah, and one thing I saw in one of your videos was this, um, it was animated, there was a, a kind of a discussion of how the economic system is based upon the principle of continuing growth. Yes, despite and you had this upward moving line, despite the fact that we just don't have the resources to grow in the way we I mean, what did you say it would take about five planets or something for everybody to exactly. have the kind of lifestyle that, that yeah, Americans well, for have. Americans, I think about 12. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um and so you know yeah. maybe you could i mean what would be an alternative system that wouldn't be unrealistically dependent upon an infinite you know infinite supply of natural resources and so on well first of all you have to work with renewables but i think right. the big problem is is in the way that we have visualized and envisioned progress and growth so somehow economists have thought that growth just means more, 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 more. And then there came the story of, oh, we don't want to just more in a progressive line. We want exponential growth. So we, we, we've made this line. We've just mainly said that, oh, that's progress. That's what we have to sell to our board members. And that means success, right? But the only pattern in nature where you see the exponential growth curve is in bacteria and viruses. I mean, don't we know that one now from the COVID crisis? Yeah. <laughs> So we, we've been behaving like, like a virus on this planet. <laughs> um, and from a systemic point of view, if you're taking this growth curve, always the one that follows after that is exponential collapse. Yeah? Mm. However, living systems don't grow that way. So for a, for a living system, for a forest, for an ecosystem like a waterway or even you know, the ocean itself, the way that living systems grow is that there are, there are moments of expansion. And when the system expands, it doesn't just expand through monocrops, it expands to diversify. And the diversity now gives rise to new collaborations, new co-creations, new innovations. And then there are moments just like autumn <laughs> when the leaves are falling, when the system contracts 
And that contraction, in that contraction, what happens is that all of those earlier experiments are being composted. The information is not lost. The information then returns to that field of life that is unified. And in that moment of integration, of returning back to the center uh, and into kind of the deep space of consciousness, that's where the impulse of the renewal comes from. That's where the transformative capacity comes from. That's your winter time that's necessary for your spring. Our economic and political systems, because they, by design, we set them up that they only have to do this expansion. We think that that is progress. By design, we have not allowed time for the integration, for the contraction, because we think contraction is bad. If we start by reimagining this in different ways, you know, um, it's amazing how we can actually stimulate and enhance our transformative capacities. When I was going through this process with um, corporations um, and, and you know, helping them to see these patterns, I'll give you an example. People in, in some of those businesses, they were not even allowed a 15-minute break because they thought that they couldn't be productive. However, when by design, we explained to the management and said, no, but if you allow people to rest, to integrate, to go within, their productivity, rather than being less, because you've imagined it on the curve, actually becomes more qualitatively. Yeah, it's not about uh, producing, producing. Um, and by so doing, you are investing in the transformative capacity of your organization. You create a better culture, you create a more better balance. Um, and that's, these are the beginning conditions of, of thriveability. So I really do believe it can start as simple as, it comes back to narrative, yeah? um, really start to question, how have we created and designed these systems? For what purpose? And what if we actually can change that? Because if we keep telling ourselves, well, that's just how the way it is and it's so hard and we can't change that. No, and nothing grows in that way. Growth is always a process of, of externalization and coming into being, expansion, and then it needs to contract. And the contraction doesn't mean that there is a problem there. No, allow it to contract. Um, yeah, like we're seeing now, we're hitting the planetary boundaries that are forcing us now to, to contract. And if you're thinking, oh, the contracting, it's going to give us problems. No, no, no. We haven't gone through that experiment of the full contraction, allowing the contraction, allowing the contraction so that it can integrate, that it can then renew, so that we then, through that process of dying to our old ways, a new impulse can be born. And then we start to see the solutions. Just like after a very good night rest. Yeah? Sometimes we wake up in the morning and go, ah, oh, I can see it now. Last night I was so stressed. I just kept focusing on it and I couldn't let it go. And it, <laughs> it just got worse and worse. And you know, we got deeper and deeper digging ourselves into the problem. And we let go at night. We allow our consciousness to return <laughs> to the <sighs> Yeah. yeah, that universal field. That's nice. Yeah. There are companies in the US where they have meditation rooms and massage rooms and ping pong rooms, and you can bring your dogs to work and, you know, all kinds of stuff <laughs> like that. And, uh, people, you know, Tammy Simon, who, who runs Sounds True, the book yes. publishing company, uh, they have a fantastic work environment. It's everybody has their dogs and it's just like this really family like atmosphere. Yeah. Um, Anyway, um, you were talking about things collapse and then all the potentialities or the information that were in the yes. systems kind of marinate or in the collapsed state and then can the integrate at a deeper field. Inter integrated and then they can kind of reemerge and reconfigure. And yes. So, um, you know, the, I, I don't know if I've asked you yet for maybe I have uh, for some kind of timeline. Do you see like some kind of, you know, collapse by 2030 or something that's going to be really significant and then a reemergence by 2040 or you know what's your sense of the, uh, maybe the, we need to go ahead yeah okay good question um uh, even think that we need to change the narrative around that collapse as well so let's because there are things that that are collapsing because by design they've been set up for this curve okay so that system is incapable of doing the contraction. If it can't do the contraction, if it can't do the renewal, if it can't go through its own 
autumn and its own winter. If it can't do that, then it will collapse. Yeah? Uh, but those, those are very rigid artificial systems that were not designed with life. So the collapse story belongs to, to that scenario. However, for those systems and organizations and cultures that are recognizing that we've done this for a long time and now we need to learn to have to, the journey of, of living within our planetary and social boundaries and thresholds. And that is not a story of collapse. It's a story of integration. We have diversified as a humanity. We've been spread out over all of those conti continents. And now we're going to make our journey back home. We're going to get to know who are we in all of these countries? Who are we among all of these different cultures and languages? So that this story, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a story of death. <laughs> it is a story of integration in a way that we've never consciously done before. We, to me, in terms of timelines, we have already started that. To me, the onset of the COVID crisis, when we had to cocoon, <laughs> whether we liked it or not, <laughs> we had to cocoon. To me, that was really the, the I, I, I marked that point as that I found that so interesting. The, the, the virus kind of put us to a stop. <laughs> uh, and that was the beginning of having to make this journey. And we just we, we are just at the beginning of that being called back to the center, being called back to integrate, being called back to contract for birth, not to contract as punishment, not to contract uh, as some kind of fear scenario, but just like for a woman to give birth, the uterus has to contract. If the uterus doesn't contract, the baby is not coming out. So the baby of our humanity it's in the womb right now. We're not out yet. <laughs> we can start to feel it, but we, we need to make that journey. I need to help people to understand those stages so that they understand what's going on. So you don't have to be afraid of it, how to work with the process and then allowing out of that integration. And to me, just intuitively, my sense is that that kind of birth point, maybe in a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in other words, the, the the really better time might really you're you're guessing of course might come in a couple of decades but between now and then there's going to be a lot of collapsing and reshuffling and yeah i think that's roughly what Dwayne eldrin was saying too and in, in his best case scenario you know maybe around 2040 2050 something like that mm. even now i mean um you can see some companies for instance, back in the 19, you're still there, right? I didn't hear any audio from you. Oh, your audio went silent, I think. Yes, yes, I'm here. <laughs> oh, okay. <Yeah. laughs> um, it, back in the 1970s, Exxon, for instance, um, scientists there realized that uh, what they were doing was contributing to uh, what was going to become a climate crisis, you know, climate change. And they had a whole division of scientists working on this and thinking about alternative energy and stuff like that and then, then they decided nah that's gonna hurt the bottom line and so they disbanded that whole department and fired the scientists and actually started spending all this money on a pr campaign to create doubt about climate change and say that it's not really a problem or there's you know a lot of the scientists don't believe it's going to happen and things like that now we're we're at you know we're we are where we are today um and I think that um, companies which play that game and don't uh, kind of like adopt, adapt to, don't, don't undercome, uh, undergo the adaptations they need to, are probably going to find it's too little too late. They won't be able to change. They won't be, you know, Exxon had the opportunity to get into alternative energies way back then, and they didn't. Um, but other companies, you know, are just um, more flexible, more adroit. They're, they're kind of going with the flow and, and changing. And so maybe those will be the ones that thrive and, and the more ossified ones will collapse. You know, and that is a fundamental pattern when you're now talking about. So again, any, any system that is really rigid and tries to resist the changes rather than being responsive towards it, it's their own death sentence. Yeah, yeah. 
they they are the ones that that, that then <laughs> simply not part of the future. The thing is, every, when they feel and sense perhaps already that they may not be part of the future, they can get more stubborn. <laughs> Right. In trying to to take and grab, you know, mm -hmm. and take people down with them, um, and and we need good uh, strategies and policies, you know, how yeah. we work with, <laughs> uh, yeah. But the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Um, yes, and yes. it's it's surprising. I mean, there have been examples. There was a big company named Enron, which is a big trader mm. in the in the energy industry, yes. and everybody thought that they were invincible, and they just boom collapse like a yeah. like the hindenburg um, and yes. that is, and you know the soviet union breaking up or the berlin wall falling so sometimes yeah. big changes happen quite suddenly and unexpectedly yes and we are in the midst of a lot of that because we have these these huge massive massive companies and organizations yeah but they don't realize how vulnerable they've made themselves again these tipping point uh, effects you know hmm. and escalating points and this is why also to get resilient for the changes it's important that we change our scaling go also go much more back to local but then coordinate local to um regional <laughs> we need a different global <laughs> not this globalization that was just uh yeah in all yeah i mean look at how vulnerable that is with the supply chain yeah. problems and the, all the exactly. boat, boats from china getting stuck in the harbor off california yes. because they you know there yes. were no trucks they were you know eighty thousand truck drivers short of what was needed to move things out of the port i mean the whole thing just got it's we're still recovering from that and um you know so obviously things have to get a lot simpler and like you said perhaps more local exactly i mean right now to me this is a time that is showing and revealing what doesn't work <laughs> yeah 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 and what may have worked for earlier times but it doesn't work for the future that is coming um but again people it's so important don't think that that what doesn't work that that is the future no that there are worlds and systems and cultures and worldviews that are that are dying, that are collapsing, that are falling away, but they were never meant. They were, they were never meant to last. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, um, but and life, it's, it's not in our best than, interest for them to last. No, it's not. Everything comes. There's a there's a time for everything to come to an end and to a completion. But the completion is not the end of the road. Yeah. <laughs> there's a, yeah, life is very creative. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you one more cool thing that I read just yesterday. Yes. There's there's a new battery that is being developed, which is made of aluminum and sulfur. And aluminum is one of the most plentiful metals on Earth, and um, it can't get overheat and explode the way lithium batteries can. And um, it charges up in one minute, and it could completely re revolutionize the whole power system, where we could have these batteries in our homes, solar panels on the roofs, and the energy distribution, the energy thing could be decentralized, and um, everyone could be locally much more self-sufficient. It would also work in electric cars. So that's just one example of something really cool that could that's it. be, that's a, be a game example. changer. Yeah exactly and of this as you just said this pattern so it's much more decentralized right so we can see in that already even in these new technological innovations the patterns that are future fit the patterns that are going to make it but this is coming out of the creativity of people exactly yeah. exactly i mean yeah. you know you could almost say in the word in a sense the world doesn't have an energy crisis it has an intelligence crisis or a creativity crisis you know and yes. that, that's the resource that we really need to tap into and then yes you know what did, quoting jesus again seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all else should be added unto thee that's it and that will invest in the in the children invest in their creativity no don't feed them the same old same old but <laughs> yeah exactly ask them what's the future that they want what future do they see there are dreams and possibilities in the kids that we have no idea of yeah of what what great inventions they may come up with support them yeah develop that help them to develop those capacities to to bring that bring that out that's why i want to live to be at least 100 i want to see what happens yes <laughs> it's, it's exciting huh? exactly <laughs> give me another 30 years um <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> yeah. So this has been great. And you know, we talked, we, we were saying in the beginning, well, what are we going to talk about? Well, we'll just wing it. So we've just spent two hours winging it and having a great time, I think. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. That's and uh, so, you know, what would you like to say by way of conclusion and also include in your conclusion, 
um, how people can plug into what you're doing. I notice you have on your website, you have all these webinars that people can do yes. live and they can also get into the archive versions of them. So what are those all about? So if people want to get more involved with you, what mm. can they do? That's lovely. Well, first of all, I every last Tuesday of the month, um, I gave a coaching class where I support people to actually develop their capacities, both for inner and outer systems change, to develop your future human potential. It includes always a teaching, it includes a practice for entering into that creative state of consciousness. And yeah, it's from where we start to see the ways forward. Um, so I'm just giving that always as consistent support as every last Tuesday of the month online uh, comes to the recording if people can't join live. That's, I started that uh, in last November and it's been hugely successful and a whole amazing community is forming around that. So when they go on my website, they'll they'll see that and there's some little free videos as well so they can get a taste uh, you know, of how that is. And then there are a lot of indeed um, you know, online courses and programs. There's a Future Humans Quest for where they really work on the deep changes, the deep transformations where we're going through. There's also called the Catalyst course that Jean and I gave um, that's also on demand. So there's a, there a lot of resources, a lot of talks, uh, there are a lot of free articles <laughs> uh, that you can just access. So yes, join the community and know that there are a lot of people here in the community um, yeah, where we're really actively working towards co-creating a world that works for all and one in which we can thrive and flourish together. So Good. via my website. Yeah. And I'll be linking to your website from your page on bathgap.com right. and also to yes. your books. And in the yes. future, if you have some new website or something like that, just let me know and I'll add it to that page. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, thank yes. you. Yes. Yes. So anyway, right. great. I really enjoyed spending this time with you. It's been Same here. And, yeah. and thank you for, for what you're doing and for bringing us together in those conversations that are really important. And yeah, maybe just as, as a final message to all of those who are, who are listening or watching, um, you know, invest in that future here. You, know, you, you are part of the future, <laughs> not the world that's collapsing, but um, yeah, believe believe in in truly in in who you are and uh, who we can be together and know that there are so many people out there around in the world uh, who believe that this more beautiful world is possible and is already alive right here it nice. is well please give jean houston my love and um I'll do that. she's so <laughs> wonderful and um we for those uh watching this uh, we've got a couple of interesting interviews coming up well lots of interesting interviews coming up. i'll have brian swim in a couple of weeks do you know brian oh that's yes <laughs> yeah. yes i've been wanting no, to interview work. him for, yeah. for years <laughs> so I'm, I'm very excited about that and um anyway there's an upcoming interviews page on batgap.com where you can see who's scheduled if you like and you can add little you can add reminders to your calendar program um, so thank you all for listening, watching, and we'll see you for the next one. And thanks again, Anna Luce. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure to be with you. Okay. <laughs> okay take care. You too. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.